Hello students, nice to be back with you and today we are going to talk about the kidneys, the ureters and the suprarenal glands. A very important topic from the examination point of view. So let us see how, uh, where are the kidneys located? The kidneys are located in different quadrants of the abdomen. So students here we see the nine quadrants of the abdomen. Uh, these are the right and left lateral planes. This is the plane at the level of L1 vertebra. This is the plane at the level of L5 vertebra. So this box is representing the epigastrium. These two are the right and left hypochondrium. These are the two lumbar regions. This is the umbilical region. This is the right elic fossa, left elic fossa, and this is the hypogastrium. So we see here that the kidneys are located in the epigastrium. They are located in the uh, hypochondrium, right and left hypochondrium and they are located in the right and left lumbar regions and they are located in the umbilical region. And one can appreciate that one kidney is lower compared to the other kidney and that is due to the presence of liver on the right side. This is the costal margin and this is the xephoid process. So this figure is showing you the quadrants of the abdomen and the location of the kidneys. Now let us reinforce this figure. Now here we see the location of the umbilicus. The umbilicus lies at the level of the disc between L3 and L4 vertebra. So uh, you can appreciate. Now these kidneys, they are extending from uh, T12 to L3 vertebra. And one kidney, the right one is slightly lower compared to the left one. Uh, we, the transpyloric plane is passing in such a manner that uh, uh, one kidney is lower and the other kidney is higher where we can make out okay through this diagram and uh, so you have to remember that the kidneys are retroperitoneal organs and they are occupying the different quadrants of the abdomen now this diagram is showing you the relations of the kidneys so kidneys i told you are retroperitoneal in fact suprarenal gland ureters uh, Iota, inferior vena cava, they are all retroperitoneal. So kidneys must be having anterior relations, the organs must be related anterior to the kidney. So first of all, you will make the kidney, this is the medial border of kidney, lateral border of kidney, upper pole of kidney, lower pole of kidney, anterior surface we can see, posterior surface is lying posteriorly. The ureters will always go inferiorly. So students, uh, in this uh, diagram, if we are going to show the relations, we have to first draw two lines in relation to the upper pole and they will demark the they will demarcate the area for this suprarenal gland so this pink structure is for the right suprarenal gland this this color is for the left suprarenal gland so once we demarcate the area for the suprarenal glands in relation to the apex of the kidneys then on the right side we will draw a c-shaped curve and this will be for the second part of duodenum so this green area is for the second part of duodenum the anterior relation of right kidney and what comes after the duodenum the jejunum so this yellow area is for the jejunum okay so it makes sense that after the duodenum comes the jejunum and the jejunum is related to both the kidneys and the duodenum is on the right side on the left side we have the organs the stomach the spleen and the pancreas which lies within the c-shaped duodenum so on the left side you know we make a curve which passes from the lower end of the hilum that is the depression on the medial aspect of the kidney medial border of the kidney we draw a line which goes up approximately to the center of the lateral border okay and then we join this line with this line and once we do that we demarcate a triangular area and this triangular red area is for the stomach this blue area is for the spleen, they lie on the left side and this light green area is for the pancreas which lies within the C-shaped duodenum. So it makes sense now if you see here the spleen is lying on the left side, the stomach then stomach continues as the first part of duodenum then comes the second part of duodenum and then comes the jejunum in relation to both the kidneys. This orange area here is for the liver in relation to the anterior aspect of the right kidney and this unshaded area white area is for the colon the large intestine the right kidney is related to the hepatic flexure of the colon while the left kidney is related to the splenic flexure of the colon and it is also related to the descending colon so i think now you should be able to understand that 
you know the organs are lying where they are as they are in the body the stomach lies above in relation to the left kidney to the left of the stomach is the spleen as they are in the body then the stomach continues as the duodenum then you have the jejunum then you have relations for the hepatic and splenic flexure of colon and then you have relation for the liver in case of the right kidney it is because of the liver that the right kidney lies at a lower level compared to the left kidney the vertebral level of the kidney is from t12 to l3 the right lies somewhat lower compared to the left and that is due to the liver okay now again we reinforce the figures uh, diagram here and now you can appreciate i want you to appreciate something see the ureter ureter is going down so one can make out that the upper pole is this one and the ureter always goes down so in practical also you know once we are given the kidneys right and left kidneys and the inferior vena cava you should appreciate that on the medial aspect of the kidney there is a depression which is called the hilum and in the hilum are entering the renal vessels which are coming from the inferior vena cava and the aorta now these renal vessels and of course the pelvis is there uh, the, they have got a relation from anterior to posterior aspect it is the vein the vein is the most anterior then is the artery then is the pelvis pelvis is the upper end of the ureter so students using this knowledge that on in relation to the hilum of the kidney from anterior to posterior aspect the structures are vap vein artery and pelvis pelvis is the upper expanded end of the ureter so if you know these uh, this relation at the hilum vein artery and pelvis from anterior to posterior side you can make out the anatomical position of the kidney because the kidney will be in anatomical position if it satisfies the following criteria that anteriorly should lie the vein with its collapsible uh, margins then should be the artery with somewhat thicker margins and then last of all should be the ureter which uh, the pelvis which continues down as the ureter proper so uh, this you can keep in mind and the direction of ureter is always downwards so that means this is the upper pole of the kidney so if you have a knowledge of the anatomical characteristics of the kidney you can you will know how to keep it in the proper position as it is in the body now this diagram is showing the posterior relation of the kidney now posterior relation of the kidney you know this green structure is, is representing the medial arcuate ligament here and the lateral arcuate ligament here this is the area for the diaphragm and this orange structure is representing the 12th rib because this is the posterior relation of right kidney uh, in case of the 11th in case of the left kidney the 11th rib will also be there here uh, in relation to the posterior aspect of the kidney then you have the psoas major quadratus lumborum and the transversus abdominis muscles from lateral medial to lateral side <coughs> here you have the subcostal vessels and nerve then this is iliohypogastric nerve this is ilioinguinal nerve let us reinforce this diagram here so you have the 12th rib so what uh, 12th rib is in relation to posterior aspect of right kidney for the left kidney we will have both the 11th and 12th ribs and then let us revise now medial arcuate ligament lateral arcuate ligament subcostal nerves and vessels iliohypogastric nerve ilioinguinal nerve and the muscles from medial to lateral side psoas major quadratus lumborum and transversus abdominis so again this diagram you know it comes in the examinations diagrammatically depict anterior relations of the kidney posterior relations of the kidney so you have to practice this diagram now uh, there are different coverings of the kidney and what are the different coverings of the kidney well uh, first of all the kidney now the kidney is represented by this uh, brown structure here and this is representing the suprarenal gland so the kidneys you know they are covered by a capsule which is uh, uh, packed around the kidney and then there is the perinephric fat which is this yellow area and then this red line is representing the renal fascia or the fascia of garota this has got an anterior layer called the, fa called the fascia of tolt and a posterior layer called the fascia of zucker candle now this renal fascia anterior and posterior layers they unite with each other and then they again split 
to enclose the supraninal gland which you can make out here and then superiorly these two layers that disappear and they merge with the diaphragmatic fascia. This blue line students is representing the peritoneal, the pleural cavity and these are the 11th and 12th ribs in relation to the kidney. Now, uh, inferiorly the anterior and posterior layers, you know, they remain separate and they cover the ureters. The anterior layer, it, uh, the posterior layer, first of all, let me tell you, it uh, goes down and merges with the fascia elica, while the anterior layer merges with the extra peritoneal connective tissue in the right elic fossa. On the lateral aspect, you know, the, uh, the renal fascia, it merges with the fascia transversalis, while on the medial aspect, the anterior layer it merges with the extra peritoneal connective tissue around inferior vena cava and iota while the posterior layer merges with the lumbar vertebra and on the medial side the renal fascia is going to form a septum through which the renal vessels they are entering the hilum okay so let us reinforce this diagram here you can see all the labeled parts here this is the anterior layer of renal fascia this is the posterior layer of renal fascia you have the kidney here you have the pleura here you have the diaphragm here diaphragmatic fascia here suprarenal gland here so uh, one thing you can appreciate here is that you know during removal of the kidney from the back uh, you know, the 12th rib may be removed for easier uh, delivery of the kidney. But uh, if there is mistake and instead of the 12th rib, we are removing the 11th rib, then we must be careful that we should not enter the pleural cavity while uh, trying to remove the kidney. So surgeons have to be very careful that they should not be mis they should not mistake the 11th rib for the 12th rib, otherwise they might enter the pleural cavity uh, you can appreciate this in this diagram then uh, vascular segments of the kidney are there you know in the hilum the vein artery and pelvis are uh, there and the artery renal artery will enter the uh, kidney at the hilum and divide into anterior and posterior branches then again these branches will further divide into segmental arteries which are end arteries and so there are different vascular segments of the kidney. This is the apical segment, this is the posterior segment, this is upper, middle and lower segments are there. So this is the labeled version which will reinforce the concept of the segments of kidney in your mind. So what are these segments? These segments are the ones which are supplied by these segmental arteries which are end arteries and their branches of anterior and posterior divisions of renal arteries as they are entering the kidneys. Okay, so then each in unit has, is supplied by a different artery so it becomes a separate entity and can be removed in case of need. Now this diagram is showing you a transverse section and here we can appreciate that which structures we must remove to expose the kidneys from behind. Remember kidneys are retroperitoneal so they must be approached from the posterior aspect. It is easier for us to approach them from the posterior aspect. So well we can make out here the skin, superficial fascia, the layers of the abdomen, external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis. We can make out the posterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia, middle layer of thoracolumbar fascia. We can make out the anterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia and here is lying the kidney. This is the lumbar vertebra. We can make out the erector spinae, psoas major, quadratus, lumborum, serratus posterior inferior and latissimus torsi. Let us see the labeled version here. So all those structures are there. This is the vertebra. So psoas major is here, quadratus lumborum, erector spinae, you know, skin, superficial fascia, external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis. Now if you see this figure carefully, I have done the uh, digitization, you know, one, two, three, four. What, what does this represent? Well, to expose the kidneys from behind, first of all, you have to cut the skin. Then you are required to cut the superficial fascia. 
then you are required to cut the posterior layer of thoracolumbar lumbar fascia and along with it the latissimus dorsi and serratus posterior inferior. Then at fourth number the erector spinae may be removed for convenience. Then middle layer of thoracolumbar lumbar fascia is there. Then quadratus lumborum muscle is there. Then anterior layer of thoracolumbar lumbar fascia has to be removed and when it is removed then we come across the kidneys. And the kidneys, you know, they have got a pad of pad of fat lying posterior to them, which is called the paranephric uh, paranephric fat. So the kidneys are having different layers. I told you before also capsule, perinephric fat. Then we have the renal fascia, and then they are finally resting the cushion for the kidneys, the paranephric fat here in this region. So all these uh, seven layers, one has to. Uh, pass through before the kidneys can be approached from the from behind okay then from the kidneys you know the ureter the pelvis pelvis is there and uh, pelvis is the upper end of the ureter and then it becomes the uh, ureter proper and then it is going to enter into the urinary bladder so now this ureters has got a length of 25 centimeter so students teachers are very fond of asking in the examinations name the structures having length of 25 centimeter and you must remember that ureter is one structure then is esophagus both of them are having length of 25 centimeter duodenum is having length of 25 centimeter and so is the descending colon now this ureter is there it is 10 inches 25 centimeters long out of which 5 inches lie in the abdomen proper and 5 inches lie in the pelvis and this ureter has got, you know, it's going to take the urine from the kidney. This ureter has got constrictions at three places. And these constrictions are important because any stone from the kidney, they might get lodged, that might get lodged in the area of these constrictions. So, you know, this is the pelvic ureteric junction where the pelvis becomes the ureter proper. So, this is the first constriction of the uh, ureter. Second uh, constriction is at the brim of, brim of the pelvis. Brim means the upper margin. So brim, upper margin of the pelvis, here again there is a cons constriction. And the third constriction is when it is passing through the wall of the urinary bladder. These are the common eli vessels. So again if we see, reinforce this diagram, mostly the diameter of the ureter is 6 to 8 mm. But you can make out here, it is 2 mm here in relation to the common like vessels, it is 4 mm and here it is again 1 to 4 mm. So why these constrictions are important? They are important because the uh, ureteric stones may get lodged or impacted here. Yes, so uh, stones are formed in the kidney, uh, mostly they are calcium stones, you know, and uh, with the urine these stones may go towards the bladder and on the way they might get lodged at the sites of constriction resulting in renal colic which is a very painful condition students uh, person is writhing in pain you know it is like giving birth to a child the kind of pain felt at that time the renal colic is also a very painful condition that is the pain due to the kidney stone getting lodged in the uh, ureters and causing the spasm of the ureters Okay, so constrictions of ureter are important and uh, you must appreciate that the ureter is passing through the bladder wall. Okay, that area is also constricted. Now we come to the suprarenal glands. You know, right and left suprarenal glands are already mentioned to you. The shape of the right suprarenal gland, you know, is classically described as pyramidal or triangular while the shape of left suprarenal gland is described as semilunar. Okay, uh, the suprarenal gland Behind the suprarenal gland is lying the re respective crust of diaphragm. Uh, the left suprarenal gland, you know, above is related to stomach and below to the pancreas, while the right suprarenal gland medially is related to the uh, inferior vena cava. And uh, so it is related medially to the inferior vena cava, and on this side it is related to the liver, the bare area of the liver laterally. Okay, so these relations you must keep in mind. The shape of the suprarenal gland you must keep in mind. Suprarenal gland has got an outer cortex, inner medulla. Yes. And uh, once again, if we reinforce this diagram, we can make out one kidney is lower, the right kidney is lower compared to the left, and it has got a triangular or pyramidal right suprarenal gland in relation to its apex. Now, uh, you know, this diagram is also a key diagram. Uh, it's showing you the branches of the abdominal aorta. So, uh, 
T12 opening of the diaphragm, the uh, iota is coming, it is passing from T12 to L4 level and it is giving some ventral branches, C like trunk, superior mesenteric at the level of L1, inferior mesenteric at the level of L3. Students, you must remember this. Okay, and then uh, these are the lateral branches, inferior phrenic arteries, inferior phrenic arteries, middle suprarenal arteries, and then we have the renal arteries. Okay, so uh, inferior phrenic, middle suprarenal, renal, and then these are the gonadal arteries. So they are the lateral branches. Now see the suprarenal glands are supplied by superior suprarenal artery, middle suprarenal artery, and inferior suprarenal artery. So superior suprarenal artery is a branch of inferior phrenic artery. Middle suprarenal artery is directly a branch of aorta at the level of T12 L1 junction. It is arising. While the inferior suprarenal artery is a branch of renal artery. So first of all, let us reinforce this diagram. Let me show you the labeled version now. So lateral branches of abdominal aorta from above to below, inferior phrenic artery, middle suprarenal artery and renal artery. Now I told you inferior phrenic artery gives superior suprarenal artery. Middle suprarenal artery is the middle suprarenal artery while the inferior suprarenal artery is a branch of the renal artery and the gonadal vessels they are arising at the level of L2. So this diagram is very important. Do practice this because it's showing you the branches of the abdominal aorta and the vertebral levels at which it is arising. So you must appreciate here the level at which C-like trunk is arising. It's the artery of foregut. The level at which L1, which is the level of the uh, superior mesenteric artery, artery of midgut. Level of L3, which is the level of uh, origin of inferior mesenteric artery, artery of hindgut. And then the artery is going to divide into its terminal branches, the right and left, commonly like arteries. Other than that, this artery also has got dorsal branches, the four pairs of lumbar arteries and the median sacral artery. So sometimes in the examinations, you know, classify the branches of the abdominal aorta. This question also comes. Okay, so since we are doing the kidney, we are concerned with the renal artery here and we are concerned with the arterial supply of the uh, suprarenal glands. So, as I told you, inferior phrenic artery gives rise to superior suprarenal artery. Middle suprarenal artery is arising from the abdominal aorta, while the inferior suprarenal artery is arising from the renal artery. And same is situation on the right side. So, this is the labeled version of the diagram which will reinforce what I have said it to you. Inferior phrenic artery gives up superior suprarenal artery. Middle suprarenal artery is directly arising from abdominal aorta. Inferior phrenic artery inferior suprarenal artery, it should be inferior suprarenal artery, this labeling is wrong, inferior suprarenal artery is arising from the renal artery, okay. Then the venous drainage of suprarenal glands, then we see here that the right suprarenal vein is draining into the inferior vena cava, while the left suprarenal vein is draining into the left renal vein. Into the left renal vein also drains the left gonadal vein, while the right gonadal vein drains directly into the inferior vena cava. So once again, let me reinforce to you, this is a very important anatomical aspect. Right suprarenal vein is draining into the, directly into inferior vena cava, while left suprarenal vein is not draining into inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava is lying on the right side. Abdominal aorta on the, on the left of the inferior vena cava. So, inferior vena cava is so near to right suprarenal gland, it receives the vein from right suprarenal gland directly. While the left suprarenal gland, its vein has to go to the renal vein, which is lying closer to it compared to the inferior vena cava. And then the left gonadal vein is also entering into the left renal vein, while the right gonadal vein is entering into the inferior vena cava. So, students, uh, Today, I focused on the kidneys, ureters and suprarenal glands. You must remember the applied aspects of suprarenal glands also and they include, you know, deficiency, uh, Addison's disease and then, you know, excess of hormones may be released from the suprarenal glands. But what I want you to take home with you from today's class is that we focused on reinforcement and we focused on interpretation from the diagrams. So, you know, reinforcement is a very important, it is the basis of learning anatomy. So, if we 
study something, we need to reinforce that concept in our minds for better understanding and comprehension. And we have to interpret. A lot is there to interpret from the diagrams. So do practice the diagrams and try to correlate the interpretation in relation to the diagrams and you will find that you your understanding has increased by leaps and bounds and that students is required that effort that hard work to understand and draw the diagrams is required to uh, be a good doctor and to uh, bring glory to our institutions we are here we have worked very hard you have worked very hard to reach to this institution and you do, do want to bring glory to your institution so uh, with that we end today's topic thank you for your time and consideration till the next time we meet it's bye from me take care and thank you